Today, folks, the Dow tumbled 475 points with the S&P 500 suffering its worst day uh, basically since January as inflation woes kind of erupt. And what we're going to do is review the broader markets today. We're going to talk a lot about commodities, diving into my 240K stock portfolio with the stocks I'm buying. What intrigues me the most this week is I have a short squeeze of a decade still that has a fascinating setup in the real estate sector. We talked, uh, we kind of abbreviated to uh, this week in some of my videos, but if that is a conversation you'd appreciate, consider hitting that like button because from tech to dividend stocks to commodities, we're going to give you that full portfolio overview of market overview today. So let's get into it by first and foremost, talking about the VIX, really representing this kind of sell in May and go away, though we're still in the midst of April. You know, that vibe, that spring sell-off vibe seems to be coming back because, man, the volatility continues to pick up, which is always a sign of a market kind of heading toward a corrective period. Not only that, I mean, the S&P is starting to take its, its glimpse of a correction. It's kind of starting to break some trend lines here. It's only down about 2.5% from the all-time high, but giving up those, those double-digit gains that we had getting into the teens since the beginning of the year. So this could potentially be that first breath. Same with the TSX here taking the biggest dump, you know, just from, you know, basically this week dropping about two percentage points. But if we take a look at the fear and greed index, people are starting to finally roll over from this kind of frothy market that we were experiencing. And I'm really feeling like we're on this tipping point of where we need to kind of consolidate at least until Q1 earnings hit. Q1 earnings will be a real defining factor of where this market continues to go. And it could potentially push it much higher because I am expecting some good results out of a variety of different tech companies. But if, if the trend remains your friend, oil companies are going to be posting great numbers, especially the way oil is continually holding up against the backdrop of so much geopolitical events. This is not only bad for inflation, as mentioned, this kind of benefits your portfolio if you're kind of exposed to these Canadian oil giants, but it's also going to detriment your portfolio from the end of inflation and the interest rate cut cycle. So it's a double-edged sword always when it comes to oil. Again, with geopolitical events, I'm not sure what's driving the gold price so dramatically, but gold is shooting up quite a lot, and it seems to be stuck in this rally where it's finally been taking a breath as well. I mean, it was just this up into the right day after day after day to finally kind of peaking at about 2400 before kind of pulling back here where we're sitting today. So we need to keep an eye on gold in the precious metal market just to see you know, what happens here and what's driving a lot of it. Because I know there's a lot of options trading out there. I think a lot of people are buying into futures and stuff like that. We also got solar panels being another fascinating aspect of what I'll call a commodity place um, that's just been dropping off a cliff. And this has been hindering a lot of the solar companies that are doing sales. I was seeing some stories out this week that people were building fences out of their solar panels or buying solar pencil, uh, panel fences because it was so cheap. Uh, again, I don't know how much this is actually playing into some of the big solar plays like Enphase, but man, we're down to about 26 cents per kilowatt when you only go back to 2010 where you're paying $2.32 a kilowatt. And I know some people that bought some solar panels and the best thing you could have done back then, especially in Canada, was you have to lock in a contract with the government where they will guarantee minimums paying for that, that, that wattage produced because back in the Day, man i know people that were printing yes the solar panels were more expensive but the deals you could get from the government were so much better than they are today so very interesting going on in the solar space when it comes to commodities if we just jump a, th a few uh a few of these what's really interesting is lithium is still trading down a lot which is great this is going to bode very well for again why companies like tesla can pull back on pricing because the cost of some of these are so cheap the uranium sector also very fascinating starting to get its first uh, real pullback since the insane rally that exploded it taking a look at natural gas where i think a a lot of people are going to be playing into it's going to be a huge proponent in the clean energy transition when it comes to companies like Enbridge that are now the largest natural gas powerhouse in, in the Western world. The same when you're looking at things like Canadian natural resources, uh, you know, because not only is this a much cleaner fuel, you know, it's trading down dramatically against oil that's continually trading up. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, we, we keep seeing a lot of, you know, countries, companies, you know, keep leaning into natural gas. We've also got lumber here still kind of trading in this one year upper range, um, but down down dramatically from those those inflationary spikes. It seems like everything that was really hindering inflation has cooled. Uh, copper is kind of rallying a little bit, but playing in the trend line. Coal, remember how expensive coal used to be, and now that's trading down. Again, all those inflationary pressures have completely alleviated, so I just can't figure out why they haven't cut interest rates. You know, I, I said they probably won't cut till summer or fall, but we're kind of in this place where we're saying that fuel prices and, and you know, housing prices, which are self-inflicted from interest rates, you know, those can't be the primary causes of leaving interest rates up anymore because, you know, the underlying, what I would call core inflation is definitely cooled off. But taking a look, even crypto, you know, is starting to take this, it keeps, it keeps kind of, you know, 
not breaking those upper trend lines. It kind of gets stuck, keeps getting rejected here. So it'll be neat to see if crypto can break out because again, it was one of these things that had these really awesome iconic runs. It seems to flatline for a month or two before it decides what direction it's gonna go into. Um, I would just be still super hesitant with it up here. You know, the buying opportunities, the real money has been made at this point. I don't know if we can continue to break out even with the happening, happening uh, you know, probably relatively soon coming up this year. So we'll see what happens. Bitcoin's always just a fun one to watch. But as we scroll through my portfolio, and we'll talk about one of my favorite stock picks this week, um, because it was really on the real estate sector. The real estate sector is starting to get very volatile because, again, it was one of the most heavy hit sectors. And though we've seen tech correct quite a bit here after a rally that happened this week, you know everything just kind of sold off after it made some pretty good gains relatively quickly. I've still been more intrigued by the recovery sector and the more interest rate sensitive sectors. So when we're looking at things like medical properties trust, as we talked about many of the Canadian rates, this US one uh, is a real outlier and it kind of almost feels like a GameStop situation. And I'm gonna to explain to you why, because it's literally trading down at its 2008 levels and it's still paying out this wicked, wickedly insane high dividend yield. But the one thing that makes it most intriguing as we've discussed is the short interest in the company. Because if we go into the statistics here, one of the things that really stands out to a lot of investors is the fact that the company basically, it's got great institutional hold, uh, ownership I imagine if this is still updated and accurate that we should probably be seeing some bottoms here. But what you want to look at is the percentage of shares that are short, which could actually bring into the institutional ownership side that the institutions that are owning it are shorting it at 48 percent percentage of shares of outstanding about 34 percent here. So, I mean, this is just fascinating to me because. You know, this isn't a company that's garbage. I mean, they went through a lot of restructuring and they recently announced that they've even uh, basically, they sold off a majority interest in their Utah hospitals. That's gonna generate approximately 1.1 billion in total cash proceeds. Their cash, uh, last time I looked, uh, which we'll take a look at the balance sheet, it was sitting in the 300 million, uh, I think, range, but they're really cleaning up the crappier versions of their tenants. And, and they're actually proving out even the crappier versions of their tenants. The value of that real estate is still highly valued because they're selling it at relatively great prices, in my opinion, right? So if we just take a look, this is a company with 19 billion in assets. You know, they've got about 10 billion in total liabilities. Not the worst balance sheet, and heck, with the money that they're generating here is definitely cleaning a lot of it up. You know, as mentioned here, if we just take a look at uh, what's their cash looking like here, cash and cash equivalents sitting at 340 million, now raising about a billion in cash. You know, they're, they're in a very great position for a liquidity standpoint. Um, actually, before we get into my portfolio, I've clicked over there, but let me dig down because I want to take a look at revenues that are continuing to maintain a pretty strong total revenue here, you know, decreasing from 352 million to 306. Again, they've been selling off some of their junkier assets. That leads their total expense to 229 million, which means they're generating a very healthy income here. We can see net incomes at about 116 uh, million. That, that kind of relates to about 19, uh, you know, earnings per share, 19 cents, uh, which is down quite a bit on the year over year basis. But keep in mind, they're only paying about 15 cents in a common dividend and they're depreciating a large portion of these assets. Um, you know, the depreciation, I think, um, you know, is equating to quite a little bit here. So this company from, you know, revenue balance sheet perspective is looking better and better as they've been cleaning up these junkier assets. So, you know, I've been looking at this as probably one of the most intriguing uh, real estate plays that currently exist in the market. I would love to know what you guys think if you're playing it. I know some people in our chat group, and thanks to those people that support on Patreon that you know we, we shoot the shit with, they've been actually playing this and seeing quite a, a, I think a bit of gains here at this point, because I mean, if you did buy some of those bottoms, we are starting to trade up and see a lot of volatility. Again, because of that news, the stock jumped 13% in after hours, you know, freeing up a billion dollars on their balance sheet from the lows here, we're still up about 29, you know, seeing about 20 to 50% return here with this, just this insane dividend that continues to get paid. So, you know, I don't know if this is, you know, worth picking up. It's just something that I'm watching and maybe I'll play it here at some point. I've talked about it pretty relentlessly. So let's get into the portfolio side of things. First and foremost, the TFSA, as I've recently added VDY at the highs, I'm down about, uh, you know, two percentage points, only about a $1,200 position, super, super small. But obviously I'm, I'm more or less playing into the tech side of things. I'm now up about $1,100 on my Google position. You can see here, uh, my 68 shares of Google. Google and Amazon, I think, were the two easiest plays in the market. Um, you know, this thing's almost trading at a 30 PE. I think it deserves to be over 30 PE uh, to trade more in line with its its favorable counterparts like Meta, which, by the way, Meta's 
trying to play into the chip sector. We'll talk about that maybe tomorrow uh, on the live stream. But we can see like Meta's trading at a 33 times multiple. Microsoft, these AI companies growing at the double digit pace should all be trading at a favorable similar PE. So I think Google still has some room to run. Amazon here up to 24% this year, crushing it. I think Amazon uh, and Google were the two favorable plays that weren't breaking all time highs. And now that they are, you know, that thesis came into play pretty accurately, right? But if we take a look at some of the other positions in the portfolio here, obviously when it comes to company, uh, companies like Tesla right now. This is one that I'm not buying for this year. And I think it's important to understand that, you know, I, even if the stock drops 50%, like I'm so like non-concerned by it. I'm down 11% on the position right now. If this thing, like I've got about $8,600 in it. So let's say it drops 50% and it actually gets down to $100 a share from my $191 buy price. I could dump five grand into it and it would immediately like cut my cost average in more than half. So that's why I'm hoping it drops is again, I've been cost averaging to this one, looking at it about a 2025 to 2027 play. That's where I think this company really starts to excel and I'm hoping it tanks miserably on its earnings. Time will tell, but the good thing going for Tesla right now is they're seems like they're listening to shareholders a lot. Elon announced that they're going to be bringing S uh, FSD now after they released it for a month as a free trial or are going to start charging 99 a month. There's been some speculation on how much cash this is going to generate. It's not going to be anything super substantial. It could be about 600 million, 500 million to about a billion, I think was what it could bring in on, on an annual basis because there's about 2 million cars, I think in the US, Canada that have um, access to the, the full self-driving capabilities. So and plus, we're going to be getting kind of the August announcement when it comes to their self-driving car. Um, and I think the cheaper version of the car, I don't know, they just had that August announcement that I think is going to be pretty pivotal. The only thing that's going to keep the stock up in the meantime is going to be hype. And clearly, there's not a lot of hype built into the stock right now. So I hope this thing continues to drop. Um, because I will keep buying these dips. I haven't picked up any shares as of recently. Again, I'm just going to wait till the Q1 earnings come out, see what the stock does, and probably pick up some shares after the fact. Taking a look at some of my other accounts, because we're still up about five percentage points on the S&P and my TFSA. When it comes to my RSP, again, just idly watching SCHD. It was over 80 bucks and has pulled back pretty dramatically ever since the Dow's corrected pretty heavily, more of a Dow-focused uh, dividend ETF here. So um, as soon as I get some contribution room and my taxes finish up this year, I'm debating on what I want to add, because I might look at taking a little bit more speculative risk in here and maybe consider adding MPW because that way I can avoid some of the U.S. withholding tax, get that massive yield and just, you know, maybe just put a small amount of money into it just as a, as a potential play into the real estate market on the U.S. side of the border, similar to like a realty income or something. But you guys tell me what you think. You think I should just keep, I'm still cost averaging SHD. I'll probably buy more either way. But man, MPW is fascinating, isn't it? Um, so you take a look at like the S&P 500 in my corporate account. This is like my longest and largest standing position where I have 179 shares that I'm still up, you know, 22.9% on. I'm not really doing much in my corporation because I'm paying out the capital my corporation owes me. I'm just holding this as a long-term Parker place for now. Um, and that's where my portfolio kind of stands this week, folks. And I'd be fascinated to know what you guys think, what you're doing. We are living in one of the most volatile markets, not only from a technology standpoint, from an inflationary standpoint, from a geopolitical standpoint and i feel like the twilight zone uh really kind of came into play ever since the pandemic happened and there's no more stability anymore in these markets so we kind of have to stomach it and it's a good learning lesson for those younger investors out there but it gives it does open up those super awesome dip buying opportunities but yeah let me know what you think in that comment section below